This is Neef Talks. We're going to talk about a, a subject that, that uh, probably most of you have heard about. It's a tragedy in American manned spaceflight history, the loss of our space shuttle Columbia and her seven-man crew. Uh, but ultimately, the story is, is a very inspirational one, and, and that's, that's our goal, is to try to get across to you all that, that even though we lost the orbiter and our astronauts, uh, the end result is, is an inspirational story of, of Americans coming together and doing what we do best is reacting in a time of crisis and, and helping each other out and, and getting, over, getting over the emotional part of the, of the reaction to the accident and really pitching in and doing what, whatever needed to be done in East Texas. And, and uh, that's the expectation that we'd like to get across. And Jonathan? Well, let's see. We'd like to get everybody on the, on the same page and talk about the accident a little bit so, so we know um, the background. Uh, we launched on January 16th, 2003. It was, a, it was a beautiful morning. I remember it like it was yesterday. Uh, we launched right on time. Had a crew of seven on board the, the orbiter uh, Columbia. Uh, beautiful liftoff. And uh, during the liftoff, you all may recall that a piece of foam insulation off the external fuel tank broke off and hit the leading edge of the left wing of the orbiter and caused some sort of a breach in the thermal protection system of the, of the left wing and allowed hot gases to penetrate the wing upon re-entry. The, uh, the foam of the external tank, the piece that came off was 1.2 pounds, about the size of a carry-on suitcase for an airliner, 1.2 pounds. And, and the foam, if you've ever used those cans of spray-in insulation at home, seal around pipes, that type of stuff, it goes in wet and expands and dries. The foam on the external tank is very similar to that. A um, little fancier, I'll, I'll give you that, a little fancier, but, but nevertheless, it was good insulation quality foam, and that broke off where the nose of the orbiter connected to the external fuel tank. The extent of the damage, we didn't know. We always reviewed launch videos starting, uh, gosh, within an hour or so liftoff. We, we reviewed still still uh, photographs from the ground and then ascent videos. That day, uh, one of our ground cameras was inoperative. It just simply didn't work. And another one was out of focus. And so you'll see later in the presentation the best views we had of the foam hitting the orbiter. Uh, but they were not conclusive where, where the foam actually hit, nor, nor did we know the extent of the damage. We debated it uh, every day of the mission. And, uh, you know, as we go through the presentation here, we obviously, we incorrectly concluded it wasn't a problem and cleared the crew to come home and, and uh, we lost the crew upon re-entry. On February 1st, uh, we gave the go for the deorbit burn um, out over the Indian Ocean and started the descent back home over California and was going to transit uh, over Texas and, and the Gulf Coast and, and over the Gulf of Mexico and into Florida. We lost contact with the orbiter over Texas. The hot plasma gas got inside the left wing, and uh, as the orbiter comes down, it gets uh, lower and lower in the atmosphere, and therefore denser and denser atmosphere, hotter and hotter, slows down more and more, heat builds up even more. And that, that ionized oxygen at the very highest levels of the atmosphere got inside the left wing and caused the damage to the wing. And it, it first compromised the hydraulic system inside the wing, which, so the crew lost all steering. And then eventually the wing burned, burned off. It melted from the inside out, and the left wing came off. Orbiter went into a flat spin and, and broke up aerodynamically. Communications was lost over Dallas, and it disintegrated in an in initial debris field about 250 miles long and 20 miles wide both the debris team that, that Mike was leading to try to determine the cause of the accident and also the team from Johnson Space Center that was analyzing the telemetry from the vehicle both came to the same conclusion and that's what the NTSB had said that if both the analysis of the debris and the analysis of the telemetry comes to the same conclusion then you found the cause of the accident. The investigation allowed uh, NASA to get the shuttle flying again a couple years later and eventually complete the International Space Station. There's our crew, uh, Commander Husband, Horizontal in the front, having a great time. A truly international and diverse crew, uh, Mike and Willie, Dave in the middle, 
Elon Ramon, first and only Israeli astronaut, uh, Laurel Clark, and, and Casey Chopna, uh, an Indian American. Truly a, an international crew. One of the things we had to do in, in the investigation was, was clear the possibility that it was terrorism that brought the orbiter down. As Jonathan said, 16 months after 9-11, and it was an Ever since 9-11, we, we had a, a very, very elevated security posture at the Kennedy Space Center for all launches. And for this one, it was, it was especially uh, elevated with Elon on board. And, and uh, uh, we did clear it was not terrorism. It was simply, simply, it was simply the foam that came off the external tank that doomed the orbiter. Yeah. Here you see a, a replay. This is the, one of the two best views we had of the foam, and Jonathan's pointing it out. It came off of, a, of an area up on the external tank with the nose connected to the tank, broke off and came down and, and shattered into those thousands of little bitty pieces when it hit the, the edge of the wing. Uh, this this uh, uh, caused a lot of people on the ground, our film an analysts, a lot of concern, obviously, that's the best view we ever had of it. And uh, we, again, incorrectly concluded it wasn't a, a safety of reentry issue. It was difficult to tell from, from this video whether it hit the front of the wing or if it hit the underside of the wing. And uh, there was a lot of debate about whether it had, uh, it had compromised the wheel well of the orbiter. And, uh, but uh, again, it's one of those things where during the course of the debates, the, uh, concerns like that never really got elevated to the extent that, 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 that people were that concerned. And I think one of the things that we saw with Challenger and again started happening with Columbia was that we've gotten away with this before in the past. And the, you know, the, uh, the orbiter is pretty strong. It can survive just about anything. A little piece of foam like this isn't going to be able to bring down the orbiter. And so uh, the management team kind of was able to convince itself that this is not a safety of flight issue. And they even relayed to the crew that this had happened, but you know, we don't see that there's any risk to reentry. I would argue the most important thing the shuttle program taught us was how to deal with reusable spacecraft, the orbiter, and, and how we on the ground dealt with recurring problems and, and, and tended to, by human nature, tended to minimize their, their potential effect on the next flight. We had a specification for the, for the tiles of the orbiter to have zero impact on the, on the tiles, none ever, zero. We had impacts every flight. We had minor damages every flight. We had a couple flights where we lost a tile, one flight where we lost a tile. Um, so so we, we got into a position where we were rationalizing problems based on previous flight history that it was okay for the next. That is the wrong thing to do. We became complacent, overconfident, and I would argue that uh, uh, it's human nature to, to do that and future programs, a new entrance in the program, reusable spacecraft of the future, need to watch out for that. Very, very difficult problem to solve. It cost us two orbiters and 14 people. Yeah, so this is, this is Columbia's reentry path. As Mike mentioned, there was a deorbit burn over the, over the Indian Ocean. Everything was going fine. It crossed the California coast at Edwards, and some of you may have seen video of the plasma trail as the, as the orbiter was coming across. It was just before sunrise out at uh, California, and, and people were noticing uh, unusual sparking in the plasma trail as the vehicle started to come down. They would see little bright flashes every once in a while. And uh, this was caught on video. There was almost nearly continuous video coverage from amateurs on the ground of the, of the space shuttle as it crossed the country. Uh, as it crossed over Dallas, um, communication was lost with the vehicle, and it was kind of thought that this was at first a typical type of communications dropout during a, a blackout that can, be, that can happen when plasma engulfs the vehicle, but it was headed towards Kennedy Space Center where Mike was on the runway waiting for it to come home. The best part of my job, I get asked a lot, what was the best part of your job, Leinbach, and, and uh, it was greeting the crew when they'd get off the orbiter at the Kennedy Space Center. End of a mission, astronauts were home safe. So I, I, was, I got to greet the crew, and, and so we were waiting by the side of the runway, 100 yards off the runway, and, and we had a large countdown clock between the shuttle landing facility, the concrete runway, and where we were standing, and it would count down to the time that Columbia should have been right in front of us. Three minutes and 15 seconds before every touchdown, you all probably remember the, du the double sonic booms, 
of the, of the, the, the nose of the orbiter first and then the vertical stabilizer, the tail, breaking the sound barrier. That's three minutes and 15 seconds. We did not hear that. That was when my heart began to sink. And then that countdown clock went down to zero. The orbiter should have been right in front of us and it was just not there. We didn't know where it was. We had no idea where Columbia was. It had to be, it was somewhere between orbit and the Kennedy Space Center. We had no idea where it was. The folks in, in Kennedy were hearing nothing but silence and Mission Control in Houston was hearing silence. The people who were along the path starting at uh, just southeast of Dallas all the way over to the Louisiana border started hearing this rumbling sound which grew louder and louder and eventually was reaching the point where it was, it was constant banging and, and booming that uh, was shaking houses to their foundations, causing things to fall off shelves. Um, it was amazing the people we talked to who were along that, that reentry path. A lot of the people didn't realize there was a space shuttle flying overhead. And so this was part of the confusion for them. They didn't know what was going on. And it turned out what they were hearing was more than 80,000 pieces of Columbia breaking the sound barrier in a continuing cacophony that lasted for several minutes. And for the next half hour, Columbia fell out of the sky. The heavier pieces continued to go at Mach 2 all the way till they hit the ground. Lighter pieces started falling out of the sky earlier.